The votes have been counted and the people have been heard. Stay tuned for CBN's coverage of election 2014. Plus, an explosive temper. I'm gonna never be a victim again. Lands him behind bars. I'm not going home for a while. And that's exactly where he wanted to be. I felt better in jail than I did on the street. Hear why on today's 700 Club. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. The president said his policies were on the ballot. Well, the people didn't like those policies. They didn't like Benghazi. They didn't like what happened in Libya. They didn't like what is going on with ISIS. They don't like the response to the Ebola. And they certainly don't like Obamacare. So they said, Mr. President, uh, you said if we like our doctors, we can keep them. And we don't like you, but so we're not going to keep our Democrats. And there were an amazing number of races the Democrats lost, including a couple of major uh, gubernatorial races, one in Maryland, one in Illinois. It's amazing what happened. And Wendy has a report. Yeah, what an exciting night, Pat, from my home state of West Virginia to Georgia, Iowa, and beyond. Republicans swept to victory. Jennifer Wishon has a look at this wave and what comes next. After a sweeping election, there's no question. Republicans are in charge on Capitol Hill. Are you having a good time? Minutes after polls closed in Kentucky, Senator Mitch McConnell was declared the winner of a closely watched race against Democrat Allison Lundergan Grimes, putting him in position to become Senate Majority Leader and setting the mood for the GOP for the night. For too long, this administration has tried to tell the American people what's good for them and then blame somebody else when their policies didn't work out. Tonight, Kentucky rejected that approach. Yeah! Voters across the country rejected the president's policies, helping Republicans rack up victories in seven states, including North Carolina, Colorado, and Iowa, the state that launched President Obama into the White House. Their voters elected a conservative woman who grew up on a pig farm and who says her mission is to go to Washington and cut pork. Well, Iowa, we did it! We did it! In Kansas, incumbent Senator Pat Roberts held on to his seat after a strong challenge from independent Greg Orman. Let's go, Pat! Let's go, Pat! In Virginia, a state pundits didn't think was in play, Virginia. voters gave Democrat incumbent Mark Warner a scare as it looked like Republican Ed Gillespie may win. But Warner declared victory after hanging on by less than 1% of the vote. Gillespie could request a recount. Well, it was a hard fought race. It went a little longer than we thought. In the House, Republicans are on track to meet or exceed 246 seats and make history, electing Mia Love in Utah, making her the first black Republican woman elected to Congress. And Elise Stefanik in New York, the 30-year-old becomes the youngest woman ever elected to Congress. In governor's mansions, many Democrat incumbents will spend the holiday season packing their bags as GOP candidates won governor's races in the president's home state of Illinois and other reliably blue states like Massachusetts and Maryland. Wow, what, what a historic night in Maryland. Big nights for Scott Walker in Wisconsin, Rick Scott in Florida, and Sam Brownback in Kansas, as all three Republican governors held on to their seats. Back in Washington, President Obama now has no allies in the congressional majority to help push his agenda his last two years. He'll meet Friday with congressional leaders to discuss the road forward. Sometimes blaming the other side is easier than doing the hard work of governing. Now that it appears Republicans have a majority on Capitol Hill, they'll have to roll up their sleeves and get to work appeasing an electorate that's tired of gridlock. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Capitol Hill.
Well, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, John Mwagi, our fearless forecaster, is with us. And John, it looks like you hit it. You messed with Pat Roberts, though. You thought he was going down, but he put on an incredible <laughs> show the he last they, month. They had a huge ground game, and I did agonize over that race. That was one, and then I missed the race in North Carolina with Tillis beating Kay Hagan. Those were the two. But uh, hundred yeah. million bucks, and and Tillis came through. Yes. it was yeah. amazing. Well, wh what else is out there? Have you got the, a word on Alaska yet? Uh, the the Final ballots are still being counted. It looks as if they have some absentee ballots to count, yeah. Pat, and that could go on for a few days, but there's a very narrow lead for Sullivan, the Republican over Begich, the incumbent. Oh, so. if, if Sullivan wins, and it looks like there's going to be a, a runoff in Louisiana and Mary Landro is going down, uh, how many will that give? Will the, will the Republican? That, that would give the Republicans 54 seats. If, if Landro goes down in Louisiana and Sullivan holds on in Alaska, that would, that would be a 54 seat Republican majority. Democrats would have 44 seats and the two independents. Will they caucus with the Democrats? We don't know. Angus King is an independent, mm -hmm. and uh, we know Bernie Sanders will. He's a socialist yeah, from know. Vermont. Yeah. But but Angus King, who knows? He, he could so make it a 50 How many total wins was this? Was it nine? You said eight. It, yes. It, it's, well, I said eight with the loss of Roberts, so I said a net gain of nine. seven. But it looks yeah. like it's going it, to be nine, uh, you know, at the end. It'll be nine. This, all right. Well, now how about the house? What did you find out? The House is, it looks like we, we had projected the House would be about 245 seats, which is right at that number that would be the governing majority that was the size of the 1946 yeah. Congress and Harry Truman. It's going to be about 245, 246 seats, could go to 247. So they, they succeeded in their goal, the Republicans did, in, in, in their House battles. Again, a gain of about 13 seats, probably. 13, well, we mm -hmm. thought of maybe 12, so it's Yeah, I, I picked 11, I think. 11. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah. I, I said 12. You said 11 is 13. Hey, <laughs> all right. We've got uh, David Brody, I believe, is with us right now on uh, by Skype or someplace or other. Dave, give us your take. You're up there on Capitol Hill. What do you think? What does this mean? Well, my goodness, it's a it's a whole different landscape uh, for sure. Starting in January, there's no doubt about it. You know, Pat, it's kind of like a, a snow forecast. You, you thought you were going to get a foot of snow, and you got two feet of snow. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really what it was because it wasn't just a mini wave. I mean, this was a this was a pretty solid uh, wave uh, for Republicans. There's no doubt about it. And so, you know, where where does the Republican Party go from here? I mean, I think there are a lot of unanswered questions ahead. Look, they're going to have an agenda uh, up on Capitol Hill. There's no doubt about it. But you know what? The president's going to come armed to that fight with his veto pen. And I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see him get out that veto pen and see exactly what he does. We do know, at least we understand this morning, uh, that Republicans will have the votes to pass the Keystone Pipeline, the XL Keystone Pipeline, uh, through the House, through the Senate now, for sure. Uh, and that means the president's going to be faced with a, with a decision pretty much right off the bat. What is he going to do? He's been punting on that for a while. And so, so that's uh, going to be in play. Uh, look, uh, Republicans also are going to uh, fiddle around with Obamacare to a degree with this medical device tax we've heard a lot about that they don't like. Some Democrats don't like it, too. And so I think that's going to be in play. And, and I think the big overarching theme here, Pat, is that House Republicans and the Senate too, but House Republicans for sure, are going to go after a lot of that federal bureaucracy, uh, mm. regulatory uh, guidelines and agencies, the EPA, all of that. And they, they, they may try and take the budget and appropriation process, which they now have control of, mm -hmm. and go ahead and basically nickel and dime Obama uh, out of a lot of those uh, regulations that he wants at the EPA and other places places because they won't fund it. And I think that's a big part of this. Uh, I heard the uh, House Majority Leader talk about tax reform. They, they really want to do something about the corporate tax. Do you, you see them doing that very quickly? I think there's an opportunity. Uh, pretty doubtful that they'll go uh, the full Monty on that, so to speak. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's 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 undecided at this point. I, I think this is the problem for Republicans, quite frankly, Pat. How far do you go? Uh, how much of a mandate do they really have? Clearly, by the uh, results last night, uh, there there's some sort of mandate. But a lot of folks will just say, and rightly so, that this was an anti-President Obama vote, not a rah-rah GOP uh, agenda vote. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And so, therefore, they're going to have to be careful on tax reform and a lot of other uh, things so they don't overextend and overplay their hand. You know, Obama says, well, I want the leaders to come together on Friday. And, and Carl Rove says it's a desperate attempt to appear irrelevant. <laughs> what, what do you think? 
Well, you know, it's interesting. Carl Rove and those folks have, have made a serious play in this election cycle. I mean, uh, Pat, let's, and, and John Waggy and I talked a little bit uh, about this last night uh, on the digital first version of, of our election coverage. And, and it, this is interesting, Pat, and I, I'd be curious to get your take on this because, you know, the, the Tea Party candidates that we saw a few years ago that made some of those gaffes, they weren't around this time. I mean, look, there were a lot of good mainstream conservative Republican candidates this time around. Cory Gardner in, in Colorado, mm -hmm. and, and, and the list goes on. Joni Ernst in, in, in Iowa as well. And so, look, um, we're not saying these aren't, these are moderate, squishy Republicans. They're not. They're conservative, but they weren't that Tea Party type conservative. They had Tea Party principles, but they weren't branded that way. And so I think the challenge now is for the Tea Party, you know, what are you going to do exactly? I mean, are you going to play along with the, uh, the, the mainstream Republicans and basically have this little fight between what works to get elected, a mainstream conservative Republican, or do you have to be branded as a Tea Partier to win? And I think that's some of the struggle here going forward. Well, I think that's what happened to Eric Cantor, the guys up there in that 7th District in Virginia. So, well, he's too incremental. We wanted a huge play. And, you know, by the way, I don't know how Brandt did. He, he won, didn't he? How, who did? Brandt, the guy that beat Cantor. Oh, yeah, Dave Bratt won. Right. Yeah, he, he won. He won the uh, election there, yes, okay. in the 7th District of Virginia. You're right. Talk about the um, governorship. We've got uh, Obama campaigned hard in Illinois for the Democrat and the Democrat He, he did. It was, it was one of the few places, Pat, where he, he actually appeared uh, in, in the final days of the campaign. Uh, high tax blue states mm -hmm. went with Republican governors in Massachusetts, in Illinois, maybe most shockingly in Maryland, where, the, where yeah. Larry Hogan is an outright conservative businessman. And Maryland does not vote red in very many occasions. But they did in this case because they were upset at, uh, about taxes. Mm -hmm. He charged the, his opponent, the lieutenant governor, with raising taxes 40 times. And obviously that message came through. And so th that's one yeah. that... that you know, they're well, going to have to Brownback take into account. Held on. He was, he was he going did. for uh, lower taxes in Kansas. He the, did. The the, uh, uh, the eliminating, the, eliminating the personal income tax and yeah. that kind of thing. And, and he's going to have a chance now to, to try his policies. Well, the so. one that, uh, and Dave, you want to weigh in on this one. Scott Walker is a very attractive candidate. Uh, I guess he's going, I don't know if he's going for president or vice president or whatever. Do you have any take on that? Well, I think obviously we were all waiting for the results to see would he win re-election again. You know, it's amazing. He, he, he got elected and then he just kept running for re-election. I mean, how many times did he run for re-election because of the recall and all of that? Yes, uh, it's, it's a huge deal that he won uh, for him specifically because it looks like uh, this would indeed set him up for a nice presidential run to say, look, the Democrats, the unions, everybody, they're throwing everything at me, including the kitchen sink. And he keeps on winning in Wisconsin, an important state. Uh, electorally, but not just that, to show that he can win in somewhat of a, uh, a purple state, a state that can go either way. And so I think I think this sets up Scott Walker very nicely in 2016. I do want to say something quickly about taxes. You talked about the taxes and Larry Hogan. Look, yeah. Sam Brownback winning in Kansas uh, yes. was huge. I mean, I mean, the, the Democrats had a tough night, but then it got even worse, a punch to the gut when Sam Brownback won because they really wanted him to lose because they wanted that tax model to lose. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. And so, I mean, nothing went right for them. I mean, they, they are, were so defeated. Now they know how Jets fans feel. I mean, I'm a Jets fan, and I, felt, I feel defeated and thumped. <laughs> All the time, and the Democrats, I think, are feeling the same way. <laughs> Dave, thank you, and John, thank you. You you did well, and ladies and gentlemen, we'll we'll be up to date on you day after day after day to watch what uh, unfolds. But uh, I hope there's not confrontation. If the president decides he wants to be confrontational, he will ruin his brand forever because now he's got a, a you know solid. Uh, Congress against him, and he just can't be vetoing everything. Sooner or later, his pen's going to run out of ink. Wendy. Thanks, Pat. Up next, we'll turn our attention overseas. The American pastor who's been imprisoned in Iran isn't the only one in his family who's fearing for his life. We'll tell you more when we come back. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Islamic State fighters tortured and abused Kurdish children after taking them prisoner earlier this year in the important battleground town of Kobani. 
They reportedly beat them with hoses and electric cables. Human Rights Watch based that conclusion on interviews with several of the boys. ISIS captured 150 back in May while the boys were returning home after taking exams. They ranged in ages from 14 to 16 years old. Around 50 of them escaped early on. The rest were later released. They said some of the worst abuse was directed toward family members of the Kurdish militia, militia who are fighting against ISIS. Well, Pastor Saeed Abedini's mother has fled Iran out of fear for her own safety. Saeed is the Iranian-born American pastor in prison for his faith, and his mother has been an outspoken advocate for his release. Fox News reports she's been barred from visiting him in jail and began to fear she might be arrested too. After enduring constant threats and intimidation, she fled Iran with two of her children. She's now safe in another country and plans to come to the U.S. The American Center for Law and Justice is working for Saeed's release. You can sign a petition on his behalf on its website. We've got a link to it at CBNNews.com. Well, for the second time in two weeks, an Arab terrorist rammed his car into a crowd of pedestrians in Jerusalem. The attack killed one and injured ten more. Israeli Minister Naftali Bennett accused Palestinian Authority, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas of inciting violence and called him the driver in the vehicle of death. Hamas welcomed the attack and said it was intended to defend the Alaska Mosque on the Temple Mount. Earlier in the day, Israeli police briefly closed the Temple Mount to subdue Arab rioters throwing rocks and firebombs. Pat, back to you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there it is, beating young teenagers for no reason except the fact that they didn't agree with you, ramming a group of innocent civilians with a car and killing them. That was uh, an act that was applauded by the uh, Hamas terrorists. This is what you have from Islam, ladies and gentlemen. Make no mistake about it. It is Islam at its core. And uh, these people haven't distorted a great religion. What they are is following the teachings of the founder of that religion. And I've offered, we've got uh, 350,000 or more of these things out right now, and I think you want one of them. It's, it's an incredible book, that beautifully uh, written and beautifully uh, illustrated uh, with uh, stunning details and research by people who are experts in the Islamic faith and also in the Arabic language. And um, Islam, a religion of war or peace. There it is. We'll give it to you. Just let us know. Have you ever read it? You, you read it? I've read it and it's amazing. You, didn't want to... you know, and when you think about how ISIS yeah. torturing innocent children, yeah. these are not men. These no. are not religious men. These are animals. These are demons. They're demons. And they've got to be stopped. And it's it just breaks your heart. You know, how much more can we take before we do something? Well, Winnie, this, in my opinion, the sight of that uh, Young, I mean, that American uh, journalist being beheaded uh, by uh, these butchers uh, is one of the main factors of this election. Absolutely. It just horrified people. And you think you've got a president who really didn't do anything about all this. And it shocked them. I think it, it was a key factor uh, in this election. Uh, all right, let's go, John. There's more. We're talking about what's going on in the Middle East and why we must be alert. That's right, Pat. A Muslim mob has reportedly beaten a young Christian couple to death in Pakistan and then burned their bodies in a brick kiln. Pakistani police say the mob attacked the couple for allegedly desecrating the Quran, and officers there say they are trying to arrest the people involved. Under Pakistan's harsh blasphemy laws, anyone accused of insulting Islam or the Prophet Muhammad can be sentenced to death. And Pat, as you know, those laws are often misused to settle personal scores and target minorities like Christians. Well, you know, I, I've said before, they, they don't do this for insulting Allah. Allah is their deity. Uh, you know, and he's not the God of the Bible, by the way. The God we worship is uh, Yahweh, the uh, Hebrew word for to be a uh, being. Uh, that's our God, uh, the one who's the author of all being. Uh, Allah is not our God, but nevertheless, you don't find any uh, mobs rampaging because of an insult. It's always the insult to the prophet. Why? Because his hold on whatever has come is so tenuous. It rests on such shaky foundations. 
And the Muslims know if they ever, that foundation begins to crumble, their entire edifice will collapse. That's why they go after these people so much about, quote, blaspheming the prophet. Wendy. Coming up, a 16-year-old blacks out and wakes up wanted for murder. That's when I knew, concrete, I'm doing time. I'm not going home for a while. Hear why that time in jail turned out to be a good thing next. July 29, 1994. 16 year old Eric Trenum attended a party hosted by a drug runner. He doesn't really remember what happened there, except this a man got stabbed, a killer got away, and Eric emerged from a nearby creek covered in blood. Eric Tranum loves to ride. It's very serene. He got it from his father. They didn't spend much time together, but he managed to pick up a few more of his interests. I drive a Monte Carlo, my dad drove a Monte Carlo. I'm an electrician, my dad was an electrician. He was a Vietnam vet, and he drank a lot to deal with a lot of the stuff that he was trying to process. He would come home, he would be angry, he would take it out on us sometimes. He also knew his dad as someone who never backed down. And one day, Eric decided he wouldn't either. A bunch of guys from high school circled around me. One of them was like, can I look at your necklace? Like up close? And then it just got passed around and all of a sudden everybody was acting like they didn't know where it went. At that moment, I knew I had a decision. I either try to fight seven or eight guys and, you know, lose or just walk away and learn from that. So that's what I did. I felt defeated. I felt, you know, embarrassed. I said, from this point on, I'm gonna never be a victim again and I'm gonna do whatever I gotta do. By that time, his parents were divorced. His dad remarried and didn't come around as much. His mother struggled to keep Eric in line. I was out and drinking and stealing and doing all kinds of bad stuff already at 12 years old. I mean, sometimes I was doing it for the rush. Sometimes I was doing it because I wanted some money or, I, or whatever. I mean, we stole clothes, we stole alcohol. Basically anything we wanted, we tried to steal it. His anger was violent and he often got into fights. One night at a party, Eric and a friend exchanged words with another boy. A fight broke out. One of the boys was killed. Eric was arrested and charged with voluntary manslaughter. He was only 16. In my brain, I just kept thinking, somehow this is gonna work out. And then, like, about a year was when court was done. That's when I knew, concrete, I'm doing time. I'm not going home for a while. Eric was sentenced to 11 years. He spent the first nine months in a juvenile facility. This is the crazy thing. I felt better in jail than I did on the street. Because in jail, there was structure. And for the first time, someone encouraged him to get to know God. I really wasn't raised with anybody that was speaking into my life on a religious level or any other level, really. When I was in juvenile hall, a guy started visiting me once a week named Reverend Tinsley. And he started sharing his faith with me. You know, he listened to me. I had so many questions, critical questions, about the whole idea of Christianity. And the guy was just like, bam, every time. I got this answer, boom, 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 every time. And I mean, he left me thinking, you know what? This stuff makes sense. The way he was explaining it, I was like, that makes sense, man. I want a love that runs deeper than a river. It was more than just finding answers that began to soften Eric's heart. Reverend Tinsley was the first man besides my father I ever let hug me, ever. And that was that in itself, just that act, him wanting to just give me a hug, had a huge impact on me at that age. All the stuff that I had been through and just feeling a physical touch of someone that was a man that actually cared about my welfare genuinely, it was, it was, it was amazing, you know? I mean, it really, it really, set me in a different direction. Eric says he felt like God was speaking to him through his reading. He asked a prison chaplain what it meant. I remember him smiling. He's like, Eric, God's calling you. 
Jesus wants you to accept him into your life. And at that point, I, I was so like touched on an emotional, like deep soul level by the whole idea. I was on board in my, in my heart. I was just like, yes, I'll do it. At 17, Eric was transferred to a state penitentiary. He admits keeping his faith was hard. I was a Christian in prison. I still was in an environment where people were getting stabbed, shot, beat up. You know, I was surrounded by guys that had done a lot of bad stuff. And so, you know, it was just a real hostile environment. After his release, Eric devoted himself to strengthening his relationship with Christ. God loves me. That's what I've been looking for the whole time. I needed somebody to just put me straight. He also joined a group of men who, like his dad, loved to ride. They're bikers for Christ. How are you guys, man? Like Eric, they want to do more than talk about God's love. Trials, Father God, we just pray that they want to show it. As soon as God got introduced to me, and I started understanding how much he loved me and how much he had my best interests in mind, it was just an immediate reaction to go, let's roll. It's you and me. How much he loved me. Oh, you know, that's what we're looking for. Every one of us is looking for somebody who loves us, cares about us. I don't care how rebellious you are, how tough your life has been, you're hoping that somebody is really interested in you as a person. And there's not some con that they're trying to take advantage of you, but they really care about you. And Eric found that somebody when he met Jesus. Somebody who cared. Somebody whose love was unconditional. You see, the love of the Lord is unconditional. He can't be taken back because the Lord has already died. He's not going to revoke his death. He died. He did it. He paid the price for you because he loves you. And he saw you just like he saw Eric. And he said, I love you. Let me put my arms around you. Let me give you a hug. You could know that I am your God and I love you. Do you want that love? If you don't know it, I just ask you to ask him. And if you'll pray with me, he will hear and he'll answer. Bow your head and pray with me right now. Do it. Lord Jesus, pray with me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. You know me, Lord. You know I rebelled against your laws. I haven't kept your commandments. But Lord, I'm sorry. And I come to you. And I acknowledge that I'm made out of dust. And I need your help. And I ask you, Lord, come now into my life. Live your life in me. And I will live for you. And I will serve you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. Thank you for coming into my heart. But if you prayed with me, give God thanks. Tell him you love him. Tell him you appreciate it. And you're not bragging to say, I have been born again. That's complimenting God. It's not bragging about you. But if you want to know what happened, what happened to you then and what will happen in the future, I've got a little thing called a new day. It's 73 minutes of very intense discussion of what's going on in the Bible. I'll give this to you free. It's called A New Day. Uh, just call in. But I want you to call and say, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord. You need to establish what you've just done. And we are here with you and here for you. 1-800-759-0700. It's a toll-free number. No financial obligation at all. Just call and say, listen, I just prayed with that guy. And I have received Jesus as my Savior. Here's Wendy. Thanks, Pat. Well, here in America, haggling with the doctors and insurance companies over our bills is part of life. So we're going to show you how an eight-year-old got life-saving surgery for free. We'll have that story when we come back. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. The British Parliament has voted overwhelmingly against sex selection abortions. The vote was 181 to 1, and the motion will move forward with a second reading in January. The London Telegraph reports the move came because of confusion over the current law 
and after two doctors were caught on camera agreeing to abort babies only because they were girls. Well, 21% of fatal car accidents involve sleepy drivers. That's the finding from a new study from the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety. This is Drowsy Driving Prevention Week, and the Washington Post reports that the head of the AAA Foundation says people often underestimate the risk of driving tired, and they overestimate their ability to deal with drowsiness behind the wheel. He adds more than a quarter of Americans admit to driving in the last month when they are so tired they have a hard time keeping their eyes open. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Welcome back. Well, in Ukraine, gypsy families are often excluded from society, and most of them live below the poverty line. That's why CBN's Orphan's Promise has been working in the gypsy community for years now, helping the people who need it most. Misha is one of five children in a very poor gypsy family in western Ukraine. Life is hard here, but Misha's life has more suffering. He has a large hernia that could rupture at any time. I live in constant fear. He needs surgery desperately, but we can't afford it. It hurts a lot, but I dream one day I will get surgery to fix it. It is difficult for me to see him tormented by pain from his hernia. It gets larger every time he goes out, walks or runs. Misha's father isn't educated and jobs are hard to find. He struggles to take care of his family by picking and selling mushrooms. Papa works as hard as he can, but sometimes we don't even have enough food at home. Misha's family goes to a church that partners with Orphan's Promise. I believe that God can do anything, even make it so I can have surgery. When I met this brave little boy and his mother and found out his hernia was life-threatening, I knew we could help. We got Misha to a hospital immediately and paid for his surgery. I can't stop rejoicing over the fact that Misha's hernia was fixed. He is better now, and my heart is at rest. He is very active now. He brings wood into the house and sweeps the floor, too. He is my good boy. We saw that the family needed more and better food so they can stay well. So we also gave them some hens so they'll have eggs to eat and sell. I am so thankful to you for your kindness. You helped us in our time of greatest need. I will always be grateful to you for that. Thank you for fixing my hernia. My stomach doesn't ache anymore. Thank you. Doesn't that just warm your heart? Well, if you'd like to be a part of helping people just like that little boy, it's so easy. All you have to do is just go to your phones right now and say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? Just 65 cents a day, $20 a month to change so many lives. And in the process, you end up changing your own life for the better, too. Well, we want to bless you when you join the 700 Club today, living under God's blessing. This is Pat and Gordon's new teaching. This will be... Uh, really life-changing. So we want you to have this. All you have to do, go to your phones right now, numbers on your screen, or you can log on to CBN.com. Well, coming up, we'll be answering your email questions like this one from Alan who asks, why does God need money? Great question, Alan. Stay tuned for Bring It On later on today's show. Still ahead. We hit the court with Washington Husky head coach, Lorenzo Romar. It never stops. You can never be totally satisfied. Now that the weather's turning, we want you to stay healthy. And we've had a great response to our Protect Your Health series. And it's not too late to request your free DVD. It includes all five segments on healthy living with top-notch advice from experts to get you. And to get your free copy, all you have to do is call the number on your screen. There it is again, 1-800-759-0700. We want you to stay healthy this season. So call right now and get your free DVD. Build up your immune system. That's yes. the secret to health. 
Well, in just one week, the curtain drops on the next college basketball. We just finished football, now they're doing basketball, but that's all right. And we just like every other year, Washington Huskies head coach Lorenzo Roman is going to have to reinvent himself. The three-time conference coach of the year has guided his team through good times and bad. And recently he spoke with sports reporter Tom Buring about how he stays, stays on top of the pressure that comes upon him. During the college basketball season, Coach Lorenzo Romar is the Washington Huskies lead dog. He's put the bounce back into a once deflated basketball program by building a new brand of success. Husky basketball is something that's relentless, that's constantly coming at you and we're trying to initiate tempo, we're trying to initiate the action, we're attacking you and then when we get the ball, we're not slowing it down. They can't afford to. As one of 351 NCAA Division I teams with a frenzied fan base, there's no relief from the demand to achieve. The more you win, the more people want you to win. For me, the more I win, the more I want to win. It never stops. You can never be totally satisfied. Romar was hired by his alma mater in 2002 to turn around three straight losing seasons, falling attendance, and insufficient academic standing. His Seattle arrival immediately raised the program's expectations and visibility. The former Huskies point guard brought enthusiasm and unprecedented momentum. Coming back and being able to do this where I was a student athlete when I attended college, makes it extra special. It took him just two seasons to reach back-to-back -back Sweet 16 appearances, three over six seasons, and one as a top seed team. He drove their program forward while raising graduation rates. In 2012, Lorenzo was named Pac-12 Conference Coach of the Year. Sustaining a program is tougher than getting it turned around. Once you're on a job for a while in this position, there isn't a lot of mystery left. People know how you conduct things. And if things don't go well for a day, a month, a year, well, you've become stale. So you have to continue to, at times, reinvent yourself. The intense pressures of a college basketball coach are constant, where success is measured by both wins and academics, all from the effort of young developing athletes. So how does Coach Lorenzo handle the strain to his job? He remains coachable willing to learn and accept a much bigger purpose with every assignment. If I'm depending on God and I'm doing everything in my power to be the best, if it doesn't work out, there's nothing else I can do about it. I may not have done a good enough job, okay? But God is still in control of my life. How can I get better? And it didn't work out here. What else does God have in store? Because there is something. It was a lesson he learned after college while playing five seasons in the NBA. As he did with basketball, Lorenzo lived life based on his performance. Getting closer with God was like a sporting event. You know, the one with the most points wins. So the more good deeds I could do, the more they could add up and I could score points with God. And that's kind of how I saw it. What does the Bible say? Because I believe the Bible was the word of God. I just had not spent any time in it. So I read through it and it was great until I realized that as I kept reading, points don't get you to heaven. The points don't give you a relationship with God. There weren't enough points that you could score as a human down here because God's standard was above, it was out of reach. Lorenzo the player measured the difference and gave God a shot. He made a way for it to work, he himself, came down to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ. He had already scored all the points basically for me and I realized something else. This deal doesn't start when I died. It started immediately. If I accepted what Jesus did on the cross, believe he rose from the dead, he was alive today to save me from my sin, asked him to come into my life, then I would cease to be a, just a creation of God but I would then become a child of God. Lorenzo was cut by the Detroit Pistons, ending his NBA career. He joined Athletes in Action, first as a player, then as a coach, before being named assistant coach of UCLA's 1995 National Championship team. God had a plan for me, and from there, 
I learned a lot of ministry, how to deal with athletes. It was as if God trained me to go out and use that, those same biblical concepts to try to affect people's lives. So what appeared to be failure in the NBA was not in God's eyes. God just used that as a little credibility here to do another job in another place. And with God, you're always going through on the job training. He's known as a top recruiter and voted as the opposing coach players would most like to play for. Under his leadership and development, Washington has had at least one player selected in eight of the last 10 NBA drafts. Six have been first round picks. I think this generation is unique. I think there are many out there that uh, don't have mentorship, don't have that type of father figure that can say, okay, this is how it's done. When you have an opportunity to mentor young people and to feel like you're having an effect in a positive way in their lives, it's very gratifying. That lasts longer than the statistics. Lorenzo Romar, college basketball coach and game changer, assisting fast break transformation while shooting from the heart. You get a scholarship, you're on the team, they're paying your way to school. But to make an impact, you're in that weight room, you're running extra sprints, doing all kinds of stuff to make an impact at that high level. And, you know, to become a Christian, it's been taken care of. You just have to agree to accept a gift. But to be an impact player for God, you gotta work. Lorenzo Lomar giving all of us some great advice. Great story. Well, we got some great questions. All right, let's go for them. What do you say? A real easy question to start off with. Well, maybe not easy, but sure. Why, Alan writes, why does God need money? Well, Alan, God doesn't need money. He owns it all. He, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, says the Lord, and the cattle on a thousand hills, it's all his. But I was reading in uh, First Chronicles today as something that I want to show you. What David said, he took up a huge offering for the temple. And uh, he was all impressed with what it was. And he said these words, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Well, that's, that's why uh, you see it all comes from him and we need to give. God doesn't need our money. We need to give. There's something about us that needs to give. And when we begin to give, we begin to set in motion activity in the, in the greater universe. This brings back things to us. Given it'll be given unto you. So God doesn't need our money. We need to give. Okay. Amen. All right. Alia writes, what do you do when you feel like giving up? You feel so bad that you even ask yourself, am I really God's child? My heart is in pieces right now and I don't know what to do. Uh, I think they use the term the dark night of the soul. It's happened to many people, even the great saints. You know, uh, look at Elijah. He said, I'm no better than my father. Take my life, Lord. You know, I mean, he, he was running from uh, he was depressed. Uh, depressed. I mean, a, a wicked Jezebel was trying to kill him. And he was all exhausted. He didn't have any money. And <laughs> I, mean, he said, I mean, he said, look, uh, I'm no better than my father. Take my life. I want to die. So does that happen? Yes, it does. We all, we all experience somewhere along the way. And what do you do? You praise the Lord in the midst of the problem. And the Bible says there's no testing that's taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will with the testing make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The way out of the wilderness is overcoming praise. So you begin to praise the Lord, you worship the Lord, and you thank the Lord. And all of a sudden, your spirit is revived and you come out. But uh, mm. there's nothing that's happened to you that hadn't happened to a lot of other people. All right. It's so true. Well, a viewer writes in, I recently started reading a blog that shows readers the occult images in today's society. The blogger has also stated that the King James Version of the Bible should be the only acceptable Bible for Christians to read, and that the New King James and the NIV have been somehow twisted and manipulated by Satan and his followers. Is this blog, blogger wrong about it, not being acceptable for Christians to read other forms of the Bible? And should I stop reading this blog? I think that <clears throat> blogger is a fanatic, right-wing, ignoramus. <laughs> How about that? I can think I, of some um, other I would second that. All right. Yeah. Look, where did the King James come from? It was translated from the Greek 
the Greek, and which version of the Greek? It was called the Textus Receptus. And who put that together along the way? A guy named Erasmus. And so uh, there are better Greek manuscripts that are closer to the autographs uh, that have been used by the uh, RSV and, of course, the, the New King James and so forth. But uh, the man who says that they're demonic, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So, no, I wouldn't read that, Bob. He's a nutcase. What else? All right. This viewer writes in, can sin diminish your reward in heaven? Good question. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, it's a little confusing as to what rewards. God does give rewards. The Bible says there are rewards for living a life for him. And uh, if you're sinning here on earth, uh, it could well diminish that. But I, I, you don't have a lot of clear theology on this. And I, I hate to uh, say something is for real when I don't have a clear scriptural foundation for it. But the Apostle Paul clearly talked about rewards in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll receive the things done in the body. And, uh, you know, by grace you're saved through, through faith, not of yourself, is the gift of God. So grace gets you into heaven. Uh, and that's what's really important, that my, I'm in heaven. But apparently there are degrees of reward in heaven. But I, I, I don't have enough theology and enough clarity to say, well, here's the way it is. But that's what, you know, the little snippets in the Bible that give us that clue. What else? All right. Grace writes, what did Jesus mean in Matthew 10, 34, 36, when he said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. It sounds so discouraging and seems opposite of the Bible's teaching on reconciliation, unity, and family. Well, Jesus didn't mean he was deliberately trying to do that, but his teaching is such that it does separate people. And we found in the Nazis, for example, and the Russians, the communists, they turn families against each other. And the, we have the spectacle of little children actually uh, uh, testifying against their parents and sending them to jail. It happened during, you know, our lifetime. And I'm sure the same thing is going on in the Islamic world. You know, these little kids get to be fanatical, and they, they say, well, my daddy said this. And so you, you, you get in a household, you're afraid to speak for fear that your child will go to school and testify against you, and you'll get arrested. So uh, that's happened. And those who love the Lord find that is true. A man's enemies will be those in his own household. All right. All right, June writes, uh, well, we got one more question. My question is about when you pray for someone to be healed, the Lord says that when two or more are gathered in my name, whatever ye shall ask, it shall be given. What about when I pray alone and in silence? I know the Lord hears me. Well, of course he hears you. He hears the prayers of sincere people, wherever they are. But there's a, a, a mystery, a unity that comes about, sort of a connection. Uh, when two of you agree on earth as touching anything that they'll ask. And so there's that unity that comes about with other people. But you can agree with the Bible. You can agree with the Holy Spirit. So you've always got a prayer partner. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm 73. As for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter. And I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. Isn't that a great word? God bless you. Well, that's all the time we've got for Wendy and all of us. This is Pat Robertson, and I say goodbye. And tomorrow, we've got the, quote, goodbye tour of country music legend Glenn Camel. His daughter talks about his career and his battle with Alzheimer's. That's Thursday on the 700 Club. You don't want to miss it. Bye-bye.